Hi, this is Leslie Gore. Don't go anywhere, because Profiles is coming right up. Welcome to Profiles, I'm Tiffany Walker. This week's guest is singer Leslie Gore. With more than two dozen hits to her credit, Leslie helped create the soundtrack to the 60s with such songs as Judy's Time to Cry, You Don't Know Me, and her signature classic, It's My Party. After a short break, we'll join our host Mickey Burns as he welcomes the most commercially successful solo singer of the 60s, Leslie Gore. Welcome back to Profiles. Leslie Gore released her first record at 16 years old while still in high school. Her first release, It's My Party, became a number one hit in 1963 while skyrocketing Gore to instant fame. Discovered and produced by the great Quincy Jones, as a team they will go on to place 15 more entries in the top 100, including four in the top 20. So let's join our host Mickey Burns on location at Ashford and Simpson Sugar Bar in the heart of New York City as he welcomes singer Leslie Gore to Profiles. Play all my records, keep dancing all night, but leave me alone for a while. Till Johnny is dancing with me. Leslie Gore, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. It's well, a pleasure to be here. Welcome to our show, Profiles. Thank you. Uh, of course, for our viewers, we, they all know you as a singer, maybe not as a songwriter, but you are both. That's correct. And uh, you've, over the course of your illustrious career, really, you've had two dozen chart hits. And what I think uh, I would categorize you best for is that you, you helped create the soundtrack of the 60s. I think that's essentially true. There were very few uh, female uh, singers at that time, not as many as we that's see right. now. So maybe uh, uh, it, maybe the playing field was a little emptier. It was, may have been <laughs> a little easier to get hits then. Um, yeah, yeah. But it was a time when uh, the record companies were first beginning to understand that they had a youth market, sure and right. they were taking full advantage of that. Um, and they actually started uh, uh, marketing young men first because they believed that it was young women uh, young girls who were going to mm -hmm. buy uh, mm -hmm. records. Okay. So the the gals kind of were a secondary thought, um, and there weren't as many of us. But I think we made an impact. And you are the most successful solo, commercially uh, successful solo uh, female artist of the '60s. Wow, that's interesting. Let me go over some of these hits, which we all know, and they still play them on the radio all the time. You still hear them occasionally? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, almost about 20 cities in this in the United States, their top uh, radio station is usually an oldie station. Yeah, so there's a, a yeah. s still a fairly good demographic who's listening to this music. Oh, sure. Let's go over some of the hits. Judy's turn to Judy's turn to cry. Well, we remember her. <laughs> oh boy. You Don't Own Me, great, right. great ballad, uh, She's a Fool, Right. Uh, that's the way the boys are, right? right? And It's My Party, I guess, is your signature song. Probably, yes. And of course, one critic recently said her best songs survive as classics. Mm. Do, you th do you think of your songs as classics? Well, y you know, I don't tend to, and yet... Um, They've been around a whole lot longer than I expected them to. Yeah, sure. uh, over 40 years, I think you can sort of call, call a, a song like that a, a classic. I can tell you that when we recorded them, we really never expected that they'd be pay being played 40 years later. Oh, I bet. I bet. Now, some, most of these huge, huge hits, and I'm sure most of our viewers will not know this, uh, that they, they were produced by Quincy Jones. Well, that is true. And used many innovative techniques on your records. Yes, he did. This man was an innovator back in the yes, 50s he when he was doing arrangements for big bands and he was doing arrangements mm -hmm. for the likes mm -hmm. of Dinah Washington and uh, Billy Eckstein and some really fantastic acts. And he, um, he actually had a big band at Mercury Records. Right. And he sent the big band, uh, Mer Mercury sent the big band out to Europe and they played and basically lost their shirts. 
Yeah, okay. they, they came home with their tails between their legs, <laughs> and Quincy then had to go to work. He actually had to put on a suit and tie, yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, ha he became an A&R man at Mercury. Yeah. And it was Quincy mm -hmm. who realized uh, that uh, this market was popping up, and he began looking for young um, artists to work with. So he heard some demos of mine, mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. me one Thursday when I came mm -hmm. home from school. I was all of about... 16 years well, old unbelievable and made me an offer i couldn't refuse and that was pretty much the beginning <laughs> and what he did do with your recordings uh, the innovative techniques that he used that weren't being used at that time were double tracked vocals that's absolutely right intricate backup vocals that's true and horns that's right um mostly rock and roll songs then were uh, you know pretty w one four five chords right quite simple yeah. uh very few uh minors mm -hmm. or sevens mm -hmm. very little uh, uh horns um yeah. well quincy this was his background he understood it and uh he he popped us as a matter of fact double voicing at that time in 63 and 64 was illegal by the union. I didn't know that. Yes, indeed. We used to huh. leave the re recording studio. We say, everything is done. Goodbye. We used to say goodnight. And there used to be usually a union member in the studio. Oh, so we'd boy. all say goodnight, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And 30 <laughs> minutes later, Quincy and Phil Ramone and, and I, we used to meet back in the studio and put the double voice on. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, yeah. were you aware that these innovative things were taking place? Well, let's face it, we were recording four track, you know, so anything four track. that was other than four track, I mean, it was pretty easy to keep track of what was going yeah. on. Okay. Uh, you didn't have to be a genius. You were, you're a native of New York City? Actually, I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. And I was raised in northern Jersey, so I have to... But the Brooklyn part will make you a native. There, there we go. Yeah. And, and the best part, I think. I think so, too. Exactly. And, of course, you, you signed with Mercury Records, and your first release was It's My Party. It was on the charts, amazingly so, one week after you recorded it. Isn't that incredible? And, and it reached number one in 1963. You were 16 uh, years old. I read somewhere that what Quincy did do was he rush released it because he heard that Phil Spector was about to record It's My Party with the Crystals. That's absolutely that true? true. That is true. As a okay. matter of fact, Phil was already in the middle of doing this song with the Crystals. Okay. They were coming off probably the biggest record of their career to do Run Run. That Man, was I'm huge. On the sun that, yeah. Okay, big, huge hit. Huge hit. He hasn't finished the track yet. He lets Quincy know literally the night we recorded It's My Party. Quincy, in his mm -hmm. brightness, mm -hmm. understood that the publisher had kind of double dealt us. Okay. There, were, there, there was a, two guys. One of the owners gave Quincy an exclusive for me. The other gentleman gave Phil an exclusive for the Crystals. Ah. Once Phil mm -hmm. let Quincy know that he was recording this song, right. Phil woke up, uh, Quincy woke up on, 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 on Sunday morning, got mm -hmm. the tape, went to Phil Ramone's studio, he ran off mm. 100 acetates, had them in the mail on Monday morning to the top 100 record stations. Wow. I heard it myself, uh, well this is kind of amazing, seven days after I recorded it on WABC driving. I was living <laughs> in Tenafly at the time. How about that? And did you love it the first time you heard it? Yeah, it took me a little while to recognize that it was mine. Mm -hmm. First time I'd ever kind of heard it on a little teeny speaker. I'm kind of looking at it like, whoa, what's going on here, you know? And then I realized as I'm singing along yeah. that it's my version. And then it, you know, sort of all kind of came right. together. It took me a little while, though. 